It's not just the extra hours you spend on the field, teaching me how to throw the perfect pitch. It was the fact that you thought I could do it. Because you're not my dad, or my brother, or even my coach. You're just someone who thought I was worth investing in. And because you thought that about me, I can think that about myself. Good morning. Well, I'm going to start this morning first with an announcement. Get that out of the way. Um, and this is for the yard sale for uh, June 10th. Um, it's from 8 to 12 and June 11th from 8 to 4. Um, they're asking that you please continue to bring your stuff uh, next two weeks. Um, it says they need help in sorting and setting up for the yard sale. In the mornings from 8 to 12 and in the evenings 6 to 9 starting Tuesday morning. Um, they need help of the day of the yard sale. So if you're unable to help, they're also asking for any type of monetary donations to help off offset expenses of the yard sale. Um, they're asking you to stop at the information center if you can help. And I think today after the second service, we are in need of help setting up tables in the fellowship hall if anybody's available. That's the only announcement for now. I'll have one later. Um, we're going to continue this morning with I Believe in You. This is week three. And um, what we're going to do is um, talk about what that means to believe in you. Uh, and if you've missed one of the first two weeks, I encourage you to go back online and catch up. Because it's, it's something I think we fail um, maybe to talk about a lot or something that is maybe way more important than what we want to give it credit for, and we want to look at that this morning and talk about that and what God uh, wants us to do, and especially speaking about our ne the next generation. But to bring this out, I want to share with you this morning, okay, a little bit what I'm talking about, and in my life, in my personal life, there's something that um, I feel that I'm pretty good at, okay, and that is I'm good with a knife if many of you don't know me, but I am good with a knife. My whole life I've been using knives, it's what my occupation is, and for me to explain that to you, I can take in a very short period of time, I can take a pig and turn it into pork chops and pulled pork and sausage and all that there, okay, so you get it, I'm good, I am, I'm really good with a knife. So with that being said, if any of you here this morning need surgery, I'm good with a knife. Keep that in mind. All right. I think really you probably would rather have someone work on you that maybe was taught and went to school and worked the side of someone else that was good in that field. Okay. Even though I'm good with a knife, okay, I think you really want someone that has been mentored and trained in that area. And it's very important that we understand that and for our church and looking at the next generation. What we, we really is encouraging is to hear people say that I genuinely want and desire and need someone to speak into my life, someone who believes in me, okay? And we also hear things like, well, I believe that people, um, and I believe that I can be a part of someone else's life. I have something to share. And that is equally as important, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. And as a church, I believe we're really at the crossroad now. We're where we need to be and many people have good intentions, okay? But if we leave it simply at good intentions and don't transfer the good intentions into actions, then we could so in many ways short-circuit what God wants us to do. 
And I don't want to be over dramatic, okay? But I will go ahead and say it because this is very, very true. If we don't impart spiritual life to the next generation, we honestly are on the road to losing the next generation. And when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ, this has been done before, all right? So we look in the Old Testament and we're talking about Moses and what he done. Moses, um, he, he, to take the next generation, and he was extremely gifted in leadership, okay? And he wanted to bring them to the promised land. He never got to do that, all right? But what he did do, and probably best of all, was he mentored the next generation. And um, he raised up Joshua, and when Moses died, he handed off the leadership to Joshua. And there was a seamless transaction. Everything went along very smoothly. Then Joshua got to do what Moses always wanted to do. Joshua got to lead the people into the promised land. He was a phenomenal leader, but he, took, he had one tremendous downside. Okay, And that was that Joshua did not raise up the next generation. And when his generation died, okay, there was tragedy in the next generation. And it's very clear in Judges 2.10, the scripture says, after the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, then what that means is they died, okay? They had been gathered to their fathers. They, they were gone, all right? And the Bible says another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel, Okay, in Joshua, in Judges 2.10. Because of Joshua's one glaring weakness, he did not raise up spiritual leaders in the next generation. The next generation came along and they didn't know God intimately or the power of all the good acts that he had done. And that's why throughout this series, and we said it over and over, we need a Paul and we need a Timothy in our life. Okay, and if you missed that in the last couple weeks, that's what we were talking about. And um, when I think about that, all of us need a Paul, um, someone who believes in us, okay? That's the key. And all of us need a Timothy, someone that we can believe in. And what's so special to me about Paul is that it was more than a mentoring relationship, okay? When you read you, the, the heart behind his words, Timothy was, was family, Okay, and as I thought about that and being raised in a Christian home and with godly parents and I thought about my life and, and an example, okay, even though I was raised in a, a, in, in a godly home with godly parents and with very good teaching, as I grew older and, and when I got married and I thought I knew it all, I knew nothing, okay, um, and the important thing here is, I'll never forget, um, in, two, in 1981, when my wife and I, Pauline, started coming to this church, one of the first things that happened was there was a pastor, and he came up to Pauline and I and said, I, I wonder, would you consider being youth advisors? I was 19 years old. I just graduated high school, okay? I didn't have a clue what I was doing, all right? But... This pastor, he believed in me and my wife. He didn't throw us out to the wolves. That's not what I'm getting at here. He didn't say, here they are, go do it. No, he came aside of us. He worked with us. And it was a mentoring process. And I want to say to this day, 41 years later, that relationship is still alive and well. Okay? Maybe not as a Paul and a Timothy anymore, but as a family and a relationship that we have together. And that's what we're looking at this morning, and it's very important. You can have or be a spiritual father. Some of you may have a very godly dad. Some of you may not. A spiritual father does not replace your biological dad, but may supplement the role of a father in your life. Or you can be that. Some of you can be that very godly spiritual example, like a dad to the next generation. In fact, in 1 
Corinthians 4, 15 to 17, it says, Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Well, let's break that down. Look at that. I think the word here, guardian, is what we need to look at. Guardian in, um, in, in Greek is, I'm going to butcher this, pahitagos, pahitagos, okay? And what that means is a tutor or an instructor, okay? So think about it. Even though you have 10,000 instructors, okay, all right? Um, and that's what we're looking at here. In other words, this person is, is to take care of or instruct. It's a bit like a nanny. You could say another, in, in, your, in your world, you have a lot of people that are involved in your life, okay? But they're not like a dad or a mother, okay? So there is a difference. They're not like a dad or uh, a mother, um, or someone who has invested interest in you, but it's kind of just a role, okay? It's not a calling. He says, and in, in, it's what Scripture says, you had a lot of guardians, or, okay, people to help you, a lot of guardians, but not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel, this is what's important here. It's through the gospel, through God's word is where we get the instruction. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Uh, you know, do, don't you want to be like your father? Don't you want to be like your dad? Okay, and, you, and you're, it's an imitation. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. For 1 Corinthians 4, 15 to 17. And um, there's a slide that's going to pop up here in a second. I want to, and this slide is not for you to look at. You know, first off, this this girl is just absolutely stunning. She's beautiful in every way, and yes, yeah, she's my granddaughter. But what I want you to get in this picture is what she's doing. She's learning. She's being taught. She's picking up an example of what mommy is doing, and she's learning. Okay, yes, this is just cooking, but it goes way more than that. As a spiritual mother and a spiritual father, they will pick up what you do and they will do it. Okay, and then we have another one. Now, I want you to look at that picture, and if you've ever seen a picture of a sponge, I want you to see my grandson there, and he is taking in everything, and I mean everything. He is learning what his daddy is doing, and he's picking it up. And that's what I'm talking, that's what we're looking at here, okay? And in Scripture, here it refers, Paul says, I'm sending you my son. Timothy was not Paul's son. He's relating to a relationship that was that important to him that it was based on that serious of a relationship that Timothy was like a son to him. And that's what we're talking about, okay? And today in our church, I feel and I think maybe this is something we do not, we don't tend to think of as spiritual fathers, and it's very important to the culture of our church. And I, I was thinking and studying this week, and, and I, I believe the examples that I use show this. I, when I was like 15 years old, I don't know exactly how old I was, I went on a mission trip with our church. And at that time, um, I was worried about something that was going on in my life. Not important what that was, but my signature sin is worry, so I worry about things. And we were traveling across the country, and I had a, 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 another man with me. Um, he was not much older than me, but he was a godly figure in my life. And that night we stayed in this motel and um, I was all concerned about it. I couldn't sleep. And finally he said to me, he goes, Chip, what's wrong? And, and I shared with him what was wrong. And he's like, I, I, want you to, I want you to get your Bible and I want you to open to Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. He said, read it to me. And I read it, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your understanding, all your ways and knowledge him and he'll direct your path. Read it again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, God, and he will direct your path. See, he was a godly father to me in that moment and an instruction that I've never forgot to this day. And that example, I can give you many examples. Another one that I can give you in our life um, later, much later on in our life, um, the Lord blessed us with our third daughter. She was born and we had a lot of medical problems and I didn't take that real well. And I'll never forget one day um, we were in the hospital and I was feeling sorry for myself. Everything was about me. It was all about me. And um, we went for a walk and this, this friend of mine, and I say friend in more like a father at this point, and he said to me, he goes, Chip, you have a choice to make. I'm like, what do you mean I have a choice to make? He goes, well, he says, you can let this destroy you. You can let bitterness take root and destroy you. Or you can look at this as a gift from God and you can give him the honor and praise for it. And he was right. I had a choice to make. He couldn't change anything where I was, but God knew what we could endure and he wasn't going to give me more than that. And knowing those scriptures and putting that in place, he was a godly example to me. And he came up, he was my Paul at that moment. Okay, now, I know you ladies, you're like, what about me? What about me? Fear not, O oh women. Listen to this. Titus 2, 3, and 5. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. They then can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husband so that no one will malign the word of God. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent. Reverent is ex someone who constantly gives thanks and praise to God. Okay, and to malign, malign the word of God is to speak harmful untruths or speak evil or slander, okay? The older women can be spiritual mothers to younger women. Why is it today there are so many screwed up marriages all over the world? One of the reasons is because there's very few godly older women mentoring the next generation, teaching women how to be women of God. There are very few godly men coming along to the next generation of men and saying, here's how you be a man of God. Here's how you love a woman. Here's how you keep your pants on. Love someone with integrity. Lift up and honor and love your bride as Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for the church. Thank you. He died for the church. Guys, if we would love our wives as Christ loved the church, there would be a whole different scenario in our life today. Most of us, we fail at this. I'm here to encourage. This is what we need to do. And this is what God wants us to do. Love, Christ as, uh, love your wife as Christ loved the church. You can have that. You can be that. The richness of a spiritual family. Everyone needs a, spa, a Paul, a spiritual father or mother. And everyone needs a Timothy, a spiritual son or daughter. And you can have that in the family of Christ, in the church. So let's do this. What I want to do for the rest of the time is I want to get uh, very practical and talk about how we do this in our everyday life. And here's where we'll start. We'll start with the Timothys. Those of you who want, to, uh, want someone to invest in you, the first piece of advice that I would, would have for you is to determine what you're looking for. What is, it, what is it that you want that spiritual parent to be? What do you need in a Paul? For example, you may be dating someone, okay, and you want to get married and she smells good, and she's soft, and all that good stuff. Okay, I get it, all right? And you may want to have, and you want to have a role model 
of what a Christian family looks like, okay? Um, you want to, so you, what you need to f- do is find a godly couple to be an example and answer questions from God's views. This is, that's important, from God's views, answer questions and show you, here's how you have a strong Christian marriage. You may be brand new as a believer, and you just accepted Christ and brand new in Christianity, and you need someone to help you with the Word of God, understanding it, okay? And there are, you want to find someone that understands Scripture and can help you read or tell you how to read to understand the Scripture. Someone that's good at interpreting the Word of God, okay? You may, um, some of you... um, you may feel like maybe you want to write a book, okay? You want to get someone that's gifted in writing. You don't want a butcher to do that. I'm good with the knife, but I ain't good at writing, okay? You can't even read it. You don't want me to do that, okay? So define what you're looking for, okay? So let me give you three quick pieces of advice for the Timothys, the sons or the daughters, who would be learning from the parent, okay? First piece of advice, you ask questions, okay? You ask questions, you listen, and take notes. When you get with your Paul, you come loaded with questions. And you want to write things down because you will forget. You need to go home, reflect on those answers, take them to God, and give them to Him to give you wisdom and understanding. Okay, And that's exactly what happened in the scripture um, with the jailer in the New Testament. When Paul and Silas were, were locked up, the jailer locked them up, what happened? God broke them out. Okay? God broke them out of jail. And if you, if you would study this, what was really important here is that what would have happened to this jailer if Paul and Silas would have left? Okay? And it, what happened is the jailer says this. In Acts 16, 29, the jailer called for lights. It was dark. He called for lights. And he rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas because they stayed there. Okay? He then brought them out and he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He asked them a question. He asked his Paul, at this point, he was, he was the Timothy and they were the Paul. And he asked them, what must I do to be saved? Come in with questions. In fact, what uh, you want to do is, is, is do that. Ask a lot of questions. You may say, well, what kind of questions? Okay, what do you wish you knew when you were my age? That's a good question. That's a great question, okay? Um, What's the best piece of advice that someone has ever given you? That's a great question. Um, What's your biggest regret? Another great question. What do you see in me that I don't see in myself? Okay? Just start there. Write them down. Ask the questions. Listen and watch what you learn. (coughs) Excuse me. From a spiritual father or spiritual mother. Second is, you want um, something you want to do is you want to put in practice what you see. Put in practice what you see. As you watch the way they live, as you listen to their advice, put that in practice. Philippians 4.9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Okay? Um, I was thinking about this this week, and I have, a, I have a couple examples, but one that was really important to me was something my dad, uh, my father taught me, and I called him daddy, and I, I remember um, distinctly saying to him, and I don't know how old I was, but my dad had a unique way of coming across, and I said to him, um, I would like to... Uh, do you think I should buy that? And it was something that I wanted. I said, do you think I should buy that? Now, he didn't say yes or no. He came back with questions. And he said to me, he goes, well, do you need it? And I could still hear him saying it. I said, yeah, I need it. He said, do you have the money? No. He said, then you don't need it. It's a want. I'm like, shook my head. Okay. And I want to tell you what he taught me in that moment was it wasn't about what I wanted or thought I needed, okay? It 
it was a very important lesson in contentment, okay? The fact is that I may have wanted it, but I couldn't afford it, so therefore I didn't. It was a want, it was not a need, and because of that, he was teaching me that it's more important to be content, and today, if we would learn that, we'd all have a lot less payments, okay? So, to me, my father taught me an extremely valuable lesson in, in that. Another valuable lesson I learned was when um, uh, back in the late 90s, and I bought, I bought a business, and um, it, was, it was run by two, um, two men that loved the Lord. And they um, came alongside of me. They stayed with me. And I remember asking one time what, what they would advice, if they were to give me advice, what would you say is really important? And I'll never forget the one said, he said, do not lie to your customers. He, and I'm like, well, that's easy. I want to tell you there is nothing harder. When you are dealing with customers and when they want you, they want to hear an answer and you know what they want to hear and they're the customer and you must speak the truth. It's difficult. It was extremely godly advice, and it's very true, and I respect them to this day. The third thing is you show honor, okay? You, do, you, you need to be, you need to honor the person that is your spiritual father, okay? That is your Paul. Scripture says in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Okay, so be respectful and show them honor. Listen, take notes, put into practice, show honor. I, I want to, I'm just going to pause a minute and I want to, I want to ask you some questions. Okay, in your field of interest, where you are in your life, okay, uh, maybe you're a mom and you want to be a better mom. Um, maybe you're married and you want a better marriage. Maybe you're a business person and you want to show Christ's love in your business. Maybe you're an athlete and you're young and you, you want to glorify God in what you're doing on that field or wherever that court or whatever it is, okay? Um, and what I want you to do is you, you want a Paul to speak into your life. That's what you want. How many of you want that? Raise your hands. I'm going to raise your hands. And I can't see it, that's that very bright. But put your hands up. You want someone to give you godly instruction, okay? Um, at the same time, how many of you feel a little bit intimidated and unqualified to be a Paul to someone else? Okay? Almost as many hands. Interesting how insecure we feel about investing in the next generation. Let me ask you a couple more questions. How many of you have been hurt by someone and you've overcome that hurt? How many of you have failed at something and you learn from that failure? How many of you have had a significant setback in your life and you've overcome that setback? All right. What you just told me is you are perfectly prepared to be a Paul to someone else. You get that? You get what you just did? Often through the failures of what we've overcome, we can make a difference, all right? Think about it. Some of you, some of you have fought a disease and overcome it. God has blessed you, and you've been overcome, and you've overcome it. Some of you have struggled with addictions, and through God, you've overcome it. Some of you have had real wrecks of marriages, and because of your trust in God, you've overcome it, and you're blessed with a good marriage, Okay? Some of you may have raised children and spent a lot of your time on your knees doing it, okay, as they got older. 
and you would be a Paul to someone else, a young family starting. So let's talk about how we do it from the perspective of a spiritual father or mother. What do I do? I don't feel good enough, okay? First thing is, you take notes. You be an example in the way you live. Just be an example. Listen to this. In Titus 2.7, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. And I'm going to have another slide, but before that slide pops up, um, many years ago, I remember as a young man leaving my house to go out running around. I had just got a car, and I was able to get away from my parents and go to live, okay? And I remember one time my mom told me, when I pull out the driveway, she goes to her knees and holds me up in prayer. And I want to tell you something. As a young man going out and doing what I knew was not a very godly example, but having a mother at home holding me up before the God I probably and almost assuredly would not be here today, but because of her and her willingness to go before God on my behalf, I am. And that is an example of a godly mother. Now, I want you to look at this picture. This is another just beautiful child, isn't she? Oh, she's so cute. That's my granddaughter. And... What I want you to look at is not her. What is she doing? She has, when my son-in-law gave me this picture, and I look at I'm like, oh my goodness. And he didn't know I was preparing to preach. And she's two years old. Her daddy, when he sits on the couch and he reclines, he puts a pillow behind his head. Keep in mind, she is two years old. And I promise you, they never told her to put a pillow behind her head. Now, a picture, I have been told, speaks a thousand words. And I want to tell you that what you do matters because they will learn from you. It is important. And I am blessed. I feel real humbled. One of my greatest goals in life is to be a godly example. And if you know me, in 30 seconds you're going to know that I'm not, okay? But I try. But integrity is very important in my walk and how I come across to others. And that is an honor and would be an honor to be known that way. The second thing that we need to do is tell stories, okay? Um, just tell stories. Here's what happened. Here's what God did in my life, okay? And you need to share it, all right? In Psalms 145, 4, and 4 through 6, it says, One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will pro proclaim their great deeds. Okay, this is what we need to do. You need to share with other people where, what God has done for you in your life and, and how you prayed about it and how God answered your prayers. Here's what God did. And, and it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give to the next generation. Now, how many of you watch television? Don't you just love it when you get a commercial right in the middle of a good show? <laughs> Guess what? We're having a commercial. Right now, a commercial. Starting today, right now, this Wednesday, all of you are invited to the Red Lion Park. Okay? And what are you going to do? You're going to share your life. This Wednesday, it starts and runs through September, Labor Day, every Wednesday night at the park in Redline, you get to share your life with someone else. There'll probably be some food there, there'll be kickball and all kinds of things going on. And it is a time to reach out to others for you to be an example to other people in the community. That's what's going on. 
All right? So we invite you into the park, all right, to share your life with other people to make a difference. It's called Presence in the Park. Back to our regular broadcasted message. Okay. So we want to invite you to do life together with other people. And in Thessalonians 2.8, Paul said, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We are to share our lives as well. And you can do that. You can. You, are, you can be a spiritual parent. You can be an example, a mentor to the next generation. I don't care if you're 87 or 17. You can do this. God is calling you. Okay? And it's extremely, extremely important. As I was studying, one thing that came to my mind was when one time many years ago, I was a Timothy. And I had a Paul in my life. We had, um, at the time, it was a, a, an organization called Promise Keepers. And I was going to Promise Keepers, and it was a men's thing. We went and we held each other accountable. And as a church, we set up men's groups. And I was involved. It was seven of us guys together. And one of, them, one of the men in that group was our senior pastor at the time here. And um, it was very encouraging when we got together as young men, young uh, uh, fathers, and um, we, would, we would bounce things off of him and we would ask him questions. And he always had godly answers. He always went to scripture and he helped us. But he got cancer and he got very sick. And us guys wanted to show him honor. And we went to the hospital and he was, he was very sick. And we went in the room, um, out, um, just respect to be there with him and share some time with him. And um, I'll never forget what he did in that hospital room. He said, guys, come here. He got around, he goes, I'm done. I'm done. My life is over. I'm done. He says, I want to pray over you right now. And he prayed over us. He passed the baton on. Man of God, knowing that the next generation, and I'll never forget, I'll never forget it. He says, I believe in you. I believe in you guys. You got this. We were a Timothy. He was our Paul. Later on in life, here I was a pastor of fellowship, and God laid it on my heart that it was time to bring someone else in. And I questioned a young, a young man, you all know him, Samuel, Samuel Miles, and I asked him if he would consider being involved in leadership. And I think it just kind of like, you know, went over his head, didn't think much about it. I went back to him some months later. I said, Samuel, have you been praying about this? He says, yeah. He says, I think I, I do want to be involved. And I said, well, I'd like you to come aside of me as pastor of fellowship and work with me because I'd like you to take over the role of pastor of fellowship. And over a few years, he has stepped up and he's, he has accepted that role. And the reason I'm telling you this is that I felt it important to pass the baton on and with Samuel taking on the role as the pastor of fellowship, okay, and teaching him and mentoring him. That's not over, okay? Even though I feel, you know, his parents were godly parents, I feel like we had a relationship like a father and son. And it worked, it worked well, it still does. We still work together. We still share with one another. We keep each other accountable. It's very important for you to take what you've been through and to make it available to the next generation, okay, is what we need to do. And if you don't, it's, un, it's a very unbeliev unbelievably selfish. We're the family of God. We're the body of Christ. There is a generation today that's cr craving spiritual fathers and mothers okay? All they want is an example. That's what they want. 
And every single one of you, you, every single one of you need a Paul. You will never do all of what God wants you to do without having someone speak into your life. And you'll never know what or how rewarding it is to be a Paul, okay? To be able to say you're like a daughter to me, you're like a son. And I see something in you, okay? This is, this, we are a family. The church is a family and we need to do this. And it would be very, very important to pass that on. And that's what God wants you to do. And I believe in you. You pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunities we have. We thank you we can come into your house this morning and uh, we can hear what you have to say. And Lord, we lift you up. We thank you for the examples that you give us, for the teachings that you give us. And uh, Lord, as we step out and become the Pauls and the Timothys that you want us to be, that we would claim your word, that we would, we would look to you for the guidance and, and for the examples that we strive to be through you for other people and to lead them and to teach them. We thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for everyone that's here and that, Lord, that we can just be a family and we can hold each other accountable and we can grow together. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have showed for us through your son and sending him to die for each and every one of us in that example. And, Lord, through him, we claim you and we just praise you, Lord, for, the, for that. Lord, we thank you for Jay and his family and Jay as he leads his congregation and he took a day off, Lord. We just ask you to bless them, be with them as they're away and uh, we just ask you to give him wisdom. We ask you to give him the vision that you have for this church and this, and this family of believers as we strive to, and march on toward the goal. And we thank you for that. We lift you, praise you, Lord, and in, just give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.